Good day and welcome to today's STS-134 ULF-6 mission status briefing. With us today are Derek Hossman, the lead space station flight director for the mission, and Allison Bollinger, who is the lead EVA or spacewalk officer for the flight. We'll start off with some opening remarks from uh, both of our briefers, and then we'll move on to question. Derek? Okay, thanks, Kelly. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be back here today to talk uh, about another uh, very successful day in the STS-134 mission. Of course, the, the primary objective today was uh, conducting our first spacewalk, EVA-1, and uh, overall went very well. Uh, we did encounter some issues with uh, Greg Shamatov's suit, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about in more detail, uh, but got uh, a lot of work, good work done today on the EVA, and uh, we, we did have to defer a, a task at the end. Um, we'll talk more about that, but we think we can get that later in the mission. And what I'd like to do is just hit the high points and then uh, hand over to Allison to talk more about the details of the EVA. Uh, first out the door, we, uh, we retrieved two DOD materials payloads that we refer to as MISSIs. Uh, we grabbed two of those off the truss, brought them back to the payload base, stowed them for return. Uh, then we installed a, uh, a new MISSI on the truss, which we got feedback just before we came over that uh, it was uh, activated and operating well. Uh, we installed a CETA light on the truss. Uh, we installed a so solar alpha rotary joint cover that was uh, left removed from a previous mission. And uh, we also were able to successfully set up for an ammonia cooling loop refill that we're going to do on EVA-2. Uh, the activities on this EVA didn't involve any ammonia QDs, but uh, we did uh, connect jumpers and vent the nitrogen pad for those jumpers. So it was, it was important that we get this done in order to put us in a good position for EVA-2. Um, the last task on the EVA involved the installation of antennas that were going to allow external payloads and the hardware uh, to to uh, communicate wirelessly with computers inside the station. Uh, we got the antennas themselves installed, but uh, the cabling was what's going to require us to require, uh, remove a, um, micrometeoroid de debris shield from the laboratory module. Right at the point that we were going to start that, uh, we got indications on the ground that there was an issue with uh, Greg Shamatov's CO2 sensor, his carbon dioxide sensor, um, and we've got written uh, pre-flight decisions uh, that we call flight rules that govern how we deal with these type of situations. In the case of this CO2 sensor, it requires that we make a more conservative estimate of the capability that uh, Greg Shamtov has left in his suit. So we did those calculations, compared that to the work that we had in front of us, and uh, we made the decision that we weren't going to continue with that portion of the task. So we did some cleanup work and some uh, get-aheads, and we called it a day. Um, and we're looking ahead at future EVAs to understand better where we're going to fit that task. Uh, it's very unlikely that we're going to change the EVA-2 timeline, uh, more likely that we're going to look at the EVA-3 timeline um, in terms of a place to put that, uh, that task. And uh, with that overview, I'll hand it over to Allison. All right. Thanks a lot, Derek. So first of all, I'd like to say I couldn't be more proud of the crew and my team here on the ground for that almost flawless execution of this EVA today. It just goes to show what extensive planning and ground coordination uh, pays off, how it pays off. So Derek pretty much stole my thunder and all I had to say about the tasks today. Uh, as he mentioned, we got out the door and we started out with the MISSIs or the material ISS uh, experiments. We put those back in the payload bay. We retrieved MISSI 8. We got that installed. It was taking Greg Shamatov a little bit longer on some of his tasks on the, the Cetalite install that Derek mentioned. So once again, exemplifying how well our, our team has works together, we were able to make a real-time call to go ahead and, and uh, transition the installation of that solar alpha rotary joint cover from it was originally planned for Greg Chamatov and we were able to just flawlessly transfer that over and Drew Foista was able to install that. So it, it worked out, the timeline worked out really well. And so, um, and another one of the reasons that we did this was as we were starting to get uh, data on the ground uh, uh, on Greg's met rate and also looking at his O2 tank pressures, we started thinking that in order to put ourselves in the best posture to be able to stay out as long EVA as, as we need to, to to get these tasks complete, that we would go ahead and complete in a recharge, an oxygen recharge of Greg's tank. So we were able to send him back to the airlock while Drew was working on installing that surge cover to allow Greg to do that O2 recharge. So then both crew members headed out to the port side of the truss and worked on installing the jumper that spanned the Sarge. Then we vented the nitrogen from the, the P1 ATA panel all the way out to the P5 junction. We vented that nitrogen and then Drew headed further outboard to vent the nitrogen from the EAS jumpers, as we call them, the final jumpers that will lead to the photovoltaic thermal control system, or PVTCS, that we will be refilling with ammonia on EVA-2. 
Once Drew was complete with that task, Greg temp stowed that jumper so it's partially installed on the P4 side and wire tied out there to allow rotation of the solar alpha rotary joint between the EVAs. We then headed off to the lab, as Derek mentioned, to install those antennas. Greg worked diligently to remove those handrails and install those two new antennas while Drew worked underneath the, the lab to start setting up the work site and setting up the cables. And it was about that time, it was actually a, a PET or phase elapsed time into the EVA of four hours and 30 minutes that we heard the words from Greg saying, I got a CO2 sensor bad message. So that was what uh, forced us to eventually kind of replan the end of the EVA. So we had set ourselves up uh, nicely to begin with by, uh, by doing the O2 recharge on Greg, but then it got the better of us when we had the CO2 sensor fail. So we had actually discussed this on the ground, different breakout points in the EVA, so the crew, was, the crew and the ground team were, were uh, definitely ready to go ahead and say, let's not open that micrometeroid debris shield and break into those cables, let's just go ahead and temp stow it and put it on a future EVA. So everyone understood that this was a possibility, and so I'm very glad that we had th those discussions on the ground. So we spent the rest of the EVA, we had Greg cleaning up the work site and mating a few additional connectors, and then we sent Drew off to the airlock to the vent tool extension bag to perform some relocation of tools in preparation for the ammonia fill on EV82. So with that, we ended at a PET, I think it was 619, was the duration for our EVA. And like I said, I couldn't be more proud of the crew and the team. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll start off with questions here at the Johnson Space Center and then uh, uh, move on to some other locations, including the phone bridge. Uh, Seth. Seth Borenstein, Associated Press. Uh, Allison, in terms of the uh, problem with uh, Greg's suit, was it, have you determined the cause for the sensor? I mean, is moisture the leading suspect, it sounds like? And two, did you determine whether there was any excess CO2 um, in it or not, or not? I guess that's a good point. So when the crew member receives that message that says CO2 sensor bad message, they initially flip to their cuff checklist, which basically tells them that the crew is now responsible for monitoring their own CO2 symptoms. So we made Greg aware of that and we said, let us know if you have, if you experience any CO2 issues and he never reported any. And we, up until that point, we had every every indication to believe that his his lie or the the, the uh, contamination control cartridge in his suit was, was working perfect, perfectly not Anomaly. So everything was fine from that aspect. Um, so we, yeah, so we made him, told him that he was primed for the CO2 symptoms. And as you mentioned, moisture is the leading cause. This is an infrared sensor. So if you get a little droplet of water in it, it causes that, causes that sensor to go off scale high. And that's what triggers that CO2 sensor bad message. So we have seen this before on other EMUs, including this particular EMU when it was used for the pump module activities uh, last summer. So we have seen this before, and it is due to excess moisture. And, and Greg did mention as he was egressing his suit that there was excess moisture in his suit. So we are looking into the cause of that. And hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to solve that problem for his next EVA, which is EVA4. And, and that EMU isn't used until um, EM, uh, EVA4. EVA4, that's correct. And in, in terms, and you didn't see any indications of afterwards of uh, excess CO2. I mean, By then, I, we had lost insight into it. And so we were just relying on the crew member's feedback, and he didn't report anything. So if you put this into EVA3, what was missing, how much does that add to your timeline? Is it 40? I mean, I remember this was a 45-minute uh, task. That's correct. It was a, it's a 45-minute task, and so we'll add about that time plus maybe a few minutes on either end for the translation to the work site. So between 40 and maybe 45 or between 45 and an hour that we would add. So how, um, forgive me, I don't remember how much the EVA3 timeline is. is it's a full six and a half hour EVA. So, so we push, still have to have future discussions about overall mission priorities and what tasks we will need to defer from this EVA. Can you go just to seven and a half hours? It depends on how consumables are, are looking. So uh, like we always plan our, our EVAs to, to six and a half hours. So we'll just have to see how consumables go on the day. And we have to take into consideration, you know, other flight day aspects, crew day length durations. And I'm sure Derek could, could answer more on that. But sometimes we can go, um, we can go longer than 6.30, but we just have to see. But before the EVA, we will not plan to longer than a 6.30. So we will have to defer some task from EVA three if we were to add that task to this EVA. Okay, we'll get the microphone to our next uh, questioner. Uh, Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. I'll, I'll uh, throw in here. Uh, when when you were getting out of the suits, um, it looked like they were looking at the uh, Greg's gloves 
uh, let me a little more closely. Did was there something that they saw there that was? Reported? I think that was just part of the normal. After each EVA, we do we take extensive glove photos when the crew members are still pressurized, so we can look if there was any damage to the RTV or any damage to their gloves. So that was just standard post EVA work. Uh, thanks, Mark Caro for Aviation Week. I think it's for Allison. Um, where, where is the sensor? And when you say water, do you mean like cooling loop water or perspiration or unknown? Or Where is the sensor? Somewhere in his backpack? I, I can't tell you. It's, it's somewhere in the place, the, the life support system on That's his back. Good. And the water can be, it can be uh, many things. It could be either just, you know, ex exhalation water, or it could be perspiration, or it could be from, from the cooling loop itself. There is sometimes water in that that can be, through when the fresh air comes over to the crew members, it can also have some water in it. So we're not really sure where the water came from. And I, and I realize you guys have gotten pretty good at troubleshooting uh, various parts of the spacesuit and refurbishing and so forth on orbit. Is this the kind of thing that you can do, do you think, or is that kind of to be determined? Actually, we do have, we have just recently started flying uh, new CO2 sensors, and they are currently developing a procedure to remove and replace that CO2 sensor, but that procedure has not yet been developed. So we're just looking for post-shuttle retirement, you know, ways we can maintain suits on the space station. So that procedure isn't ready to go yet. Okay, Rob. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, with regards to the uh, wireless antennas, if you weren't able to get to that, what systems would not be reachable via, or what does this, ex what what payloads does this do? These new antennas extend out to what does it enable the astronauts to uh, control? It's a it's a system that's designed to communicate with payloads and hardware on the. ELCs and the ESPs, the external pallets on, on the truss, and it's, um, it's not a critical system that's required to operate those boxes today. It, it's, a, um, you know, it's an augmentation of the capability that we have today. So in regards to prior, prioritizing what, going back and doing this task versus the other tasks that were scheduled on the CVA, do, do the antennas rank pretty high or is it something that you could save for a stage EVA later? Um, it, it's something that could be done on a stage EVA, but in order to install the antennas, we have to take down one of our communication loops. So it's ideal to perform the task with the shuttle dock because we, we have their communication loops as a backup. So that's one reason we'd like to do it during the dock mission. And just purely in terms of priorities, it ranks higher than a number of the tasks on EVA 3. Gina? Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Allison. Would you mind teeing up the next spacewalk for us? <coughs> well, sure. Uh, so EVA2, we have Drew Foistel and Mike Fink going out the door. Um, the, there are two main purposes on this spacewalk. One is to perform the ammonia refill of that P6 PVTCS, the photovoltaic thermal control system that I spoke of. So we initially, we go out there, we, we hook up the jumpers, essentially the pipeline that runs out to P6. We initially start flowing ammonia from the port side ammonia tank assembly, and we do a leak check to verify that we have a good that we have a good pipeline running out um, almost to P6. And then once we verified we have a good pipeline, we give the we give Drew a go to start refilling the the PVTCS itself. Uh, while that's while he's working on that, uh, Mike Fink is working on the port sarge um, relubrication. So he will remove uh, sarge covers six uh, sarge covers and he'll start the relubrication using two different styles of grease guns underneath that. Um, so while once Drew is complete with the fill, he'll then set up to vent the ammonia because we need to vent, vent the ammonia from those jumpers. So he'll, he'll set up the, the vent tool and the vent tool extension and then he'll start. Initially we have a longer, a 17 minute vent which vents the ammonia from P6 back to the, the P1 ATA. While that vent's ongoing, he stops by and helps Mike out for a bit with the sarge lube. Once the vent's complete, he then heads back outboard to vent the smaller jumper that runs to the P6 PVTCS. Once both crew members are complete with uh, the venting ops and the sarge lubrication ops, they work together to restow the jumper that spans the P3, P4 sarge. So once they get that jumper uh, stowed, both crew members move inboard and we start rotating the sarge 200 degrees, which sets us up for the second part of the sarge lubrication. While the sarge lubrication is ongoing, uh, Drew is working on Dexter. He is installing a lens cover, a CLA lens cover on the camera on Dexter's latching end effector, and he's also using one of the, one of the same grease guns that we used for the sarge lube to grease the latching end effector. 
Uh, meanwhile, Mike is working on installing the S1 radiator grapple bar stowage beams, which will be used uh, to hold radiator grapple bars in the future. Once the crew members are complete with that task and we're done with the Sarge rotation, both crew members head back outboard to the port Sarge and work together to complete the second Sarge lubrication. They reinstall those six covers and that wraps up EVA2. Okay, any more questions here in Houston? Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com again. Um, for Allison, for for doing the replanning, uh, I assume for EVA three for this uh, to finish the EWC wireless in install task, um, are you are you going to save that basically until after you get done with the second EVA, and then also um, who are the who, I assume the EVA crew are all cross trained, so would this would be different. Slightly yes, exactly. different EV crew. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah, so on on EVA one, you know, it was Drew Foistel and Greg Chamatoff, and EVA three is Drew Foistel and Mike Fink. And so, we are fortunate in that the number of uh, you know the extensive training that we've done, we've been able to add in a cross training run. So all crew have been trained on pretty much all of the tasks. So uh, we have to continually work in the EVA world. We never have a moment's rest. So while the prime team is focused on EVA2, we'll have our planning shifts and other teams working on replanning EVA3. So we, we were able to have a brief discussion with the crew today and kind of got some thoughts on where they would like to put the task. And once we understand from the program, the overall mission priorities, we'll start working on that replan. But it'll be going on in the background during the EVA2 preparations. Seth Bornstein, AP. Um, I guess for Derek, what is the bottom of the priority list in EVA3 and essentially what could be bumped? We got uh, two main tasks on EVA3. We're installing a, a power data grapple fixture on the FGB and then installing the cabling, the 1553 data cable and, and the power cable to that, to that uh, PDGF. And we're also installing, we're basically rewiring the flow of power from the U.S. segment to the Russian segment by installing two sets of what we call y, y cables. And the, the priority for the Y cable work is higher than the PDGF work. So, so again, we need to go off and look at the details of this and, and, and uh, talk about the priorities and anything that's changed since we've launched. But it's likely that we would look at some of these, uh, the uh, tasks associated with the FGB power data grapple fixture. You know, we can get, for example, we can structurally install the PDGF and then maybe we don't get the cables installed. Or alternatively, we can install a portion of the wide jumper. So, I mean, those are the kind of trades we need to do. Okay, thanks. Uh, we're gonna go now to our phone bridge calls and uh, take questions from those reporters. Uh, let's start off with uh, Space Launch News. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Uh, thank you, Charles Axel, SpaceLaunchNews.com, examiner.com. For Derek, as a flight director, could you share your thoughts on uh, tomorrow morning's special call from Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, um, as His Holiness calls the space station crews uh, from the Vatican? Yeah, you know that this uh, this flight has been a series of firsts, and you know we I guess we first started talking about this phone call a few weeks ago, and uh, when we had the launch delay, uh, it, it was there was doubts or questions about whether it would still happen. So I'm just. I'm personally thrilled and honored that uh, that we found a way to make it happen. I mean, it's a pretty amazing event and a series of amazing events for 134. Now, is this the first people call uh, to space? I believe it is. Okay, Charles, any further questions? No, that's all. Thank you. All right, we'll go on to Denise Chow. Hi. Um, just, I know you said that the timeline for EVA2 would likely stay intact, but I'm just wondering if um, not having the, the cables complete um, for EVA1, does that impact any of the tasks at all that will be carried out in the second space walk? No, it does not impact any of the tasks on the EVA2 timeline. Okay. And just a, a note for clarification, did you say that the most recent time that you saw this issue of um, the CO2 sensor and excess moisture was on the uh, ammonia pump replacement? That was correct. Uh, that happened last summer, was it July or August of 2010, was the, the last time that we saw the, this issue with the CO2 sensor. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think next on our list is James Dean. Hi, thank you very much, James Dean with Florida Today. Um, Allison, uh, regarding the uh, Greg's oxygen recharge, uh, that was described as being 
uh, fairly common or not uncommon for a first-time spacewalker. Why is that? And it's not just for uh, first-time spacewalkers. It's basically, it's, it's all based on your metabolic rate and just you as a human, how much oxygen you consume. So we see these O2 recharges happening quite frequently on EVAs. As the EVAs get more complex and we start running towards the end, sometimes extending beyond six hours and 30 minutes, we just on the ground like to be proactive and go ahead and get that O2 recharge to ensure that we have the most oxygen available to us. So it's, it's not uncommon to see. And I don't think it's specifically uh, linked to first-time crew members. Thanks. And, and then just a couple of questions about the, um, the EVA2 uh, work with the coolant loop. Um, I, I know it's described as a very small leak, and you're refilling about five pounds, I believe, of ammonia. Could you just, could you offer any uh, more context on the, the size of this leak, I guess, the, the um, capacity of, of this loop, how much you're adding to it, and, and how long that supply would last if you didn't refill it right now? Yeah, the, uh, it, it's a leak that's not likely to be observable with the human eye um, or with you know, any of the video cameras that we have on the truss. So it's, you know, I guess I would term it almost imperceptible in terms of what, what we can do with an ins EVA inspection, for example, or with any of the, the uh, assets we have on the station. And I, I don't have the answer for the total capacity of the loop, but I can, I can certainly get that. And what, uh, what folks think is that if we were not to refill it, that something on the order of uh, 18 months to two years, that the, that the quantity of the loop would fall to a level where the loop would no longer uh, be able to perform. Thanks a lot. And then finally, um, I just want to confirm if the, the refill, is that triggered by uh, the spacewalkers are down on the ground and, and also wondered if you could just kind of refresh uh, for us why ammonia is always such a tricky substance to work with out there. You want to get what, what was the first part of the question? The ammonia refill, is it triggered on the ground? Being run by the ground or is it, do the crew members actually activate that? Okay, that's a good question. It's actually, it's a tag team between the EVA crew members and the ground. So the EVA crew members are the guys who are actually out there physically manipulating the, the fluid quick disconnects that run from the ammonia tank all the way out to the P6 PVTCS. But it's ultimately uh, the Thor console position here on the ground that, that will open up the ammonia tank valve that will allow the ammonia to flow out to uh, P6. So it's, it's a coordination between the two. And your second question was on ammonia and why it's tricky to work with. Um, yeah, it seems like uh, um, fairly common uh, when working with those lines to, to see some, some, some leakages, I guess, and some potential for the crystals, I guess, to get on, contaminate the suits. And I guess I was just asking about the, the potential for contamination and why you have to be so careful with, with ammonia. And that's correct. Yeah, ammonia is a hazardous substance. So if we were to bring it into the ISS environment, it would be hazardous to the crew. So we have procedures in place for the crew if they were to be contaminated by the ammonia or get ammonia crystals on their suit to perform a visual inspection and then help each other sublimate the ammonia off. And then we have calculations that we run on the ground to uh, verify that they've sublimated all the ammonia off. And then we also perform a contamination test upon upon ingress before we enter the rest of the ISS atmosphere to verify that we've baked off essentially all of the ammonia that was on the suit. And traditionally, we've had issues with these ammonia tasks because the fluid quick disconnects are not so quick to disconnect. And it's a lot of moving parts, and they're kind of difficult to manipulate. And crystals can kind of get hung up. So we've seen quite a few crystals uh, lately when we've been manipulating the, the fluid quick disconnects. So we, while we feel there is a slight chance uh, for ammonia contamination on EVA2, the crew has been well prepared on, on how, to, how, to, uh, how to deal with it if it were to happen, and then how to perform those contamination tests on repress. Thank you. OK. We'll go on to our next uh, caller, uh, Chris Waldemar. Yes, thank you. It's Chris Waldemar with Reuters. Uh, I realize uh, these are early days uh, for the tile inspection, uh, but just uh, a question for Allison. I reckon, uh, are there any early plans or discussions about uh, uh, quarry crafting uh, an additional spacewalk uh, for um, uh, an inspection should one be necessary. That's you know, I truthfully can't answer that question because, um, you know, I've I've been focused on all the nominal EVAs. So we have a, what we call a team four, another team who's been off working on attending all the meetings and all the discussions and all the planning. So I truthfully don't know uh, what what discussions are in work there with that. 
the thing that would happen before we went off and did a spacewalk would be what we call a focused inspection, which would be a closer look at the damaged sites um, with the OBSS and the other sensors that we have. And that decision has not been made yet. Um, you'll get a brief briefing later today at, I think, 2.30 um, post-MMT uh, to talk more about uh, tile damage and the direction we're headed. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I think that's all of our phone bridge callers. Do we have any follow-up questions here in Houston? Mark? Thanks, uh, Mark Corot for Aviation Week. Um, and I just wanted to go back to um, the, the sensor issue on the spacesuit. Is there a larger component you could swap for Greg Shamatov so he can do uh, additional spacewalks? Um, I think yeah. he's assigned some more, and I just don't know what what options you have to. Equip yeah, and I, I guess initially uh, to to talk more about the sensor, um, this this issue is kind of intermittent since it's water that's caught in the loop. We have in the past done what we've called a, a dry out procedure to basically run oxygen through that sensor, hoping it'll dislodge the the water bubble. That's worked before in the past, so we're, there are ongoing discussions with the engineering community about if that's how we want to proceed. And we've had other times where we've, we've seen this issue on one EVA, and by the next EVA, it's gone. So there's really, there's really no, um, there's no way to tell if it's going to happen again on EVA 4. And as far as a bigger component, um, the, uh, Greg wears a size extra large suit, and we only have one extra large suit on the space station. So there isn't another suit that he could, that he could uh, swap into. Uh, Philip Sloss with NASASpaceFlight.com for, for Allison. Um, it, bearing that in mind, then, is there anything you can do sort of planning-wise going into EVA-4 then in case this happens to protect the, the, the objectives there? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we would just have, have to make sure we, we understand. Like I mentioned, we were able to have pre-flight discussions with the crew and the ground team about breakup points for each EVA if in the, in the instance we got into a case like this. So we've already had those discussions with EVA-4 talking about, as we saw today, once that CO2 sensor failed, it, it forced us to cut about 50 minutes off of what we thought we had um, for uh, for the EVA duration, so we would just you know try to try to stay on top of of what tasks would fall off the end of the EVA, and we would just make sure that that everyone is on the on the same page if that were to happen again. Uh, Seth Bornstein at AP again. If the one b uh, before the EVA four starts, is there a way? Do you test the suit to make sure that the uh, can you test it to see that the sensor is working or not? We don't nominally test it, but if we were to perform the, the dry out procedure that I spoke of, we do test the, the CO2 sensor at the end of it. I think there probably is a way that even if we didn't do that test, we could still basically turn the suit on the day before to see if to see how the CO2 sensor was acting, but we haven't had those discussions and, yet. And just to take the hypothetical one step further, you say you do this and you test it and it's still not working. Do you then send him out, Greg out, with a non-functioning CO2 sensor, or do you swap someone else in? I think that would be a discussion we'd have to have. Uh, this, the CO2 sensor isn't required to go out EVA, as we mentioned. The, the crew member can be prime for, um, for detecting his CO2 symptoms. But as Derek mentioned, we do have a flight rule in place that tells us we need to subtract time off the end of the EVA. So if, if we went out the door knowing that we had a failed CO2 sensor, that would probably force us to do a shorter duration EVA. Okay, it sounds like that's the end of our questions, and so we'll begin to wrap this briefing up. A few programming notes uh, coming up at uh, noon central time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we'll have today's post-International Space Station Mission Management Team briefing, and that'll be Kenny Todd, who's the uh, Acting Operations Manager for the Space Station, and Courtney McMillan, who's the Team 4 Flight Director, who's been working on the Soyuz Photo Opportunity Planning. Uh, and then an update on our next briefing, which will be today's post-mission management team briefing. It's actually going to be at 2 p.m. Central Time, 3 p.m. Eastern. And that'll be with Leroy Kane, the Space Shuttle Mission Management Team Chairman. And so with that, we'll send you back to space. <laughs>